There's a belief that comes up again and again whenever great white sharks are discussed, that white sharks in Australia are more aggressive than the ones I see here in California. It's a claim that usually points to higher fatality numbers, more serious injuries, and some of the most vivid shark encounters on record, especially in recent years. But the question is, does that actually mean the sharks themselves are different? Are they really more aggressive in Australia? Over the years, I've spent thousands of hours along the California Mexican coast watching great white sharks move through the same shallow water where people swim, surf, and paddle every day. I filmed them passing within a meter of surfers, cruising through lineups, sharing space with kayaks and swimmers, often without anyone in the water even realizing they're there. It's kind of been a staple of this channel. And after all that time observing them near humans, what stands out most isn't aggression. And no matter where I post this footage, whether it's right here on YouTube or on my Instagram or my Facebook, the same comments always show up. That California sharks are just not as aggressive, that they are more chill, and that Australia is where the aggressive ones are. But is that really the case? So that makes me ask a question. What if I spent the same hours off the coast of Australia observing great white sharks around people in similar ways, would I see something fundamentally different? Or are the outcomes we associate with Australia being shaped by factors that have less to do with the sharks themselves and more to do with how and under what conditions these encounters are happening? In this video, I wanna slow this conversation down, not to defend the sharks, not to downplay the real incidents, because people have seriously been injured, people have lost their lives, and that matters. I'm around white sharks almost daily. I know they can injure and kill humans. I fully acknowledge that, but understanding why something happens isn't the same as excusing it. It's through understanding that we gain a clearer picture of these animals and how they behave in an environment that is ultimately their home. So let's look carefully at what the data actually shows and what might explain why encounters in Australia so often end differently than what I've documented here in California. Before we go any further, just a quick note. If you value this kind of evidence-based approach to shark behavior, and you wanna see more of these observations, please consider liking this video and subscribing. It really helps this work reach a wider audience and keeps these conversations grounded in facts rather than just fear. Now, let's start with the first thing we need to clarify. When people say great white sharks in Australia are more aggressive, what they're usually reacting to isn't behavior, it's an outcome. Injuries that are more severe, incidents that end in fatalities, and encounters that escalate faster and feel more violent. But aggression isn't a scientific label. It's a human interpretation. If we're going to compare sharks in Australia and California honestly, we need to be clear about what would actually qualify as an aggressive behavior. Is it the number of encounters, the number of bites, whether a shark returns for a second bite, or how much damage occurs in a single interaction? Because those are all very different things. A shark can cause catastrophic injuries without being more aggressive, simply because it's larger and conditions are different or help arrives later. And a shark can be highly motivated to investigate something at the surface without having any intention of actually attacking a human. So in this video, when we talk about aggression, we're not talking about emotion, we're not talking about intent. We're talking about measurable factors, how often encounters occur, how they unfold, and what influences whether they stop or escalate. Only once we define that clearly does it make sense to compare Australia and California at all. So let's look at some baseline data. Year after year, the United States actually records more unprovoked shark bites overall than Australia, according to the International Shark Attack File. That alone complicates the idea that one region's sharks are simply more aggressive than another. And when you narrow that focus down to California, the long-term fatality numbers are remarkably low relative to how heavily this coastline is used. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife lists 16 shark-related fatalities going all the way back to 1950. Australia, on the other hand, maintains a dedicated national shark incident database. And when researchers analyze that data, one thing becomes abundantly clear. In Australia, white sharks account for more recorded bites than any other species, including tigers and bull sharks. So yes, Australia does see more serious outcomes associated with great white sharks. But here's the key point. 
Those numbers don't prove that Australia and Great Whites are inherently more aggressive. What they do suggest, however, is that different levels of exposure, different environments, and different rescue medical realities can dramatically shape how these encounters end. Even if the underlying behavior of the sharks themselves is very similar, and that's where this comparison really starts to matter. Because part of the reason this perception exists is that the public understanding isn't shaped by averages. It's often shaped by the small number of highly visible incidents, including a few fatalities in Australia that were captured or reported in near real time. Those instances circulated globally and were viral. I don't need to mention specifics. You all know what I'm talking about. These moments leave a lasting impression, but they don't on their own define the everyday behavior of a species. If we're going to understand why encounters in Australia are often look more severe, we need to shift the focus away from the shark itself and look at the conditions surrounding those encounters. One of the biggest differences is where these encounters occur. Many incidents in Australia happen along remote stretches of coastline places with limited access, longer response times, and significant distance to advanced medical care. In those environments, even a survivable injury can become fatal if help can't arrive quickly. California has remote areas too, but a large percentage of the shark encounters that happen here happen near populated beaches where lifeguards, faster extraction, and quicker, quicker access to trauma care exists. In Australia, reaching a major trauma center can often take hours especially when incidents occur far from population centers. And this isn't just theoretical. So a quick side note here, Dr. Chris Lowe from the Cal State Shark Lab here in Long Beach talks about this exact issue on the Beyond Jaws podcast. He breaks down several California shark bite case studies that likely would have been fatal if they had occurred in more remote locations. I'll link to that episode in the video description below. It's really worth watching. Now, aside from access to a trauma center, there's visibility, there's water conditions, and the geographic topography of Australia. In many of the areas where serious incidents occur, water clarity can be low, whether from surf turbulence, river runoff, or shifting sand. These conditions reduce contrast at the surface, especially during dawn and dusk sessions. And for a visual hunter like a great white, that matters. Sharks aren't making decisions with perfect information. They're responding to silhouettes, movements above them, and contrast. Yes, this can and does occur in specific locations in California too. But here's where the topography may make a difference. There are many areas where deep water sits close to shore, with steep drop-offs and surf breaks positioned right next to pinniped colonies. This creates a very different operating environment than many of the places I film here in California. Now imagine a location like the Farallon Islands being right next to San Francisco rather than a day's boat trip out. Incidents would likely be higher. However, one swimmer recently swam from the Farallon Islands all the way to San Francisco without incident. So there's that. Now the bottom line, all this means is it's not more aggressive sharks, but more complex conditions where mistakes are more likely to have serious consequences. I want to be clear about one thing here. That doesn't mean great white sharks don't know what humans are. They're intelligent animals. They are capable of recognition. But knowing something exists isn't the same as always interpreting it correctly in complex real world conditions. Sharks don't operate with perfect information. They're making rapid decisions based on movement, contrast, and context, sometimes with limited visibility and competing sensory cues. And like any wild animal, they're capable of making mistakes, just like we do. Not because they're confused about what a human is, but because the conditions don't always allow for certainty. One of the most consistent patterns in great white shark encounters, whether in California, Australia, or, or anywhere for that matter, is that they tend to involve a single interaction, often a single bite, sometimes just a close pass and then disengagement. That pattern is important because it tells us something about intent. A great white shark investigating something at the surface isn't committing to an attack in the way many people imagine. It's gathering information. For example, last year, a video out of nearby New Zealand went viral showing a kayak fisherman being closely followed and investigated by a rather large great white shark. 
That shark pursues the kayak for a long distance. It approaches and then it pulls away. It's tense, but it's familiar because that behavior is nearly identical to what I've documented here in California. Now, I've seen it from the air countless times. I've even experienced it personally from a kayak. The shark in that video maintains proximity. It tracks movement. It tests distance, but it doesn't escalate. That kind of interaction isn't about aggression. It's about assessment. And based on what I've observed here in California, that New Zealand encounter follows the same pattern I see when a white shark is trying to acquire visual information. In many kayak encounters, subtle changes in movement or orientation are often enough for a shark to lose interest and break off. Just watch how this shark moves when the surfer looks directly at him. Now the New Zealand viral video isn't an outlier. It's a clear example of how most kayak encounters unfold when a great white is investigating. In all likelihood, had that kayaker simply turned the kayak slightly, even faced the shark directly, the shark likely would have quit the pursuit. But he continued for quite a while in a direct path, and the shark continued following. Now, great whites are visual hunters, but vision alone doesn't always give them enough information. So they rely on a combination of cues, movement, contrast, sound, electrical signals, all of this to decide whether something is prey, threat, or neither. Based on what I've observed here in California, if I were to spend the same amount of time observing white sharks in Australia, I suspect that many of the encounters I document would feel very similar. Because what we're really seeing is consistent behavior patterns, one that shows up again and again, no matter which coastline you're looking at. Okay, so before we wrap up, there is a concept or a theory I just can't shake. I want your thoughts on this. I want to be clear up front that this is just a theory, not a conclusion. It's a, a thought experiment. In Southern California, young white sharks spend years in shallow water, regularly passing surfers, swimming, kayaking, all without incident. Well, not all, but mostly without incident. In Australia, shark mitigation strategies like nets, drum lines, and exclusion measures are designed to reduce encounters near shore. And they do. But it raises an interesting question. If young white sharks are prevented from encountering humans early in life, does that change how a shark perceives a human later on when it's larger, stronger, and encountering something unfamiliar? Not more aggressive, but less familiarity, less context, more uncertainty. Does a shark who hasn't been around a human early in life have a greater chance to take an exploratory bite later in life upon seeing one? Again, I'm not suggesting this is happening but it's worth asking, it's worth thinking about because behavior doesn't develop in a vacuum and early experiences often shape how animals interpret the world around them. It's a good thought experiment and it hones back the old age question of do sharks know what humans are? And maybe that's the real takeaway here, that the difference between California and Australia isn't about aggressive sharks versus calm ones. It's about context, exposure, and the moments that follow an encounter. It's the same species, different coastlines, different conditions. And when we slow the conversation down, what we're left with isn't a simple answer, but a clear understanding of how complex these interactions really are. All right, so that's gonna wrap us up for this week. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to hit like, comment, and let me know what you think about the questions I've asked in this video. Uh, as always, your support means everything to me, especially the folks over on Patreon and on the YouTube membership page. Thank you so much. Uh, until next time, I'm going to go look for some great whites. <laughs>